Welcome back to this session on uh, active learning. So before we progress, let me talk about what we have done so far. So in the morning we had one session where you were introduced to the concept of active learning, why it is required and so on. And then we have gone in depth into two such techniques. One was think pair share and the other was peer instruction. In this session, what we will talk about is the flipped classroom model and the reason why it is relevant to you is because you may be the local instructor for the blended uh, MOOC version of CS1 where you may be using videos created by somebody else for your students. So the key question is what do we do in the classroom at that time. Okay? So before we start, let me pose one scenario, consider a scenario. There are two teachers A and B for a given topic. So teacher A gives a lecture on the topic in class followed by problem solving exercises for students to practice at home and teacher B asks students to watch a video of the lecture at home before coming to the class and does the problem solving activities in the class. Okay, so what I am going to do now is to create a, a, a view poll and then instead of doing it through clickers this time I am doing it through a view. So the question now is according to you which of the teachers is better okay so let me put back the the slide so teacher a is giving lectures on the topic followed by problem solving exercises for students to practice teacher b asks students to watch the video of the lecture at home before coming to class okay? and this is the poll that we have to do according to you which teacher strategy is better a b or both are equally good so this one is not being sent through the clickers. So what we can simply do is coordinators can convey your RC's majority vote as your response for the AVU poll. Okay, so this is encouraging in the sense that more than 50% of the centers are already saying that teacher B is better and the other 50 percent are equally split between saying teacher A is better or both are equally good. Okay. So what we will do is a quick short activity. Okay. So what we want is a debate between two groups. So in your center you <coughs> some of you will be A and some of you will be B and those of you who are A should list points for why teachers A strategy is better than teacher B and those of you who are B should list points for why teacher's B strategy is better than teacher A. So you can send two points in favor of each of the views. So it is not necessary that one teacher is clearly always better than the other. So those of you who are A should send points in favor of A and those of you who are B should send points in favor of B. Okay, so I am starting to get responses saying in A there is direct interaction with student student should get the idea of topic first and can have doubt, say A is more interactive, student will get a concept at a quick time, A can have live commanding on the students, B people are saying students can grasp the ideas fast, interaction with students for teacher B is better, teacher A is traditional method, teacher B is new method, basic ideas are already talked about for teacher B, interaction between teacher and students will be there, students can attempt higher level problems. Okay, so that is good. So it is encouraging to see that the morning sessions, as a result of the morning sessions, many of you have got the idea of what is active learning and why it is useful. Most of the points that are coming on the chat are valid points. So let me summarize. So I think you will find that your points are also included here. So when teacher A is doing lecture in class plus exercises at home, in the teacher's perspective, the teacher can adapt the lecture dynamically to the student's response. So this we feel is the biggest advantage 
of teacher A that I can look at my students reactions and I can dynamically adapt to the students needs right. Also from the students perspective we feel that the student can ask questions to the teacher during the class itself. So, this these two seem to be the most benefit from the teacher A's style perspective. Okay. However, if we keep in mind what is the drawback? So, the key drawback is that the student does not have access to the teacher while working on problems at home. So, student at that time when they are actually trying to apply their knowledge, they have to do it on their own and like we saw in the uh, one of the earlier sessions, we become experts only when we practice, we do not become experts by simply listening to somebody else however well that person may be explaining right. And the second thing is that the teacher does not know what difficulties students face while doing the problem solving. So, these are the two main drawbacks of teacher A, although teacher A has these two advantages. Now, if you look at teacher B. Uh, some of you have already responded saying that students will develop self learning ability ok. So, that is one good thing. So, now if you look at it from the teacher's perspective, it turns out that in teacher B case, this teacher can address the students problem solving difficulties in the class. So, this being able to address it in the class is a big advantage, because the teacher is available to the student at the time when the difficulty happens. So, for the student again the key thing is that the student can watch the lecture video at their own pace. So, if they did not understand something they can go back and watch it again and so on. And the second thing is they can get immediate help from peers and teachers during the problem solving process. The key drawback in this case is that the teacher has to put in more effort to create the video and the teacher has to put in more effort to create activities to be performed in class. Let us look a little more closely at what we want to do in this session. So, in this session what we will learn is what is a flipped classroom and what are its advantages and identify some active learning strategies to effectively integrate flipped classroom into your teaching ok. So, there is a lab version which we will not be doing here, we will do that some other time ok. So, what we want to see is that in a typical traditional classroom largely what happens is what is called information transmission ok. So, the instructor lectures and the student take notes. Sometimes the instructor asks questions and the students respond. Sometimes the students ask questions and the instructor responds. So, these are the activities that predominantly take place in the class in the teacher A mode ok. And what happens outside the classroom is what is called assimilation of the knowledge ok. So, the instructor gives problem sets and assignments which the students solve and submit and now students may work individually or in groups. So, I will give you a minute to think about what might be the disadvantage of this information transmission model ok. So, what we find is that for the traditional classroom model during class now the instructor is lecturing, but students do not pay utmost attention. So, that is what is happening even now that I am often the one who is most excited about my subject. So, we are all as teachers we are excited about the subject and right now also I am lecturing assuming that everybody is paying a lot of attention to me. Now, that assumption need not be valid I mean it is quite likely that it is invalid, because many of you may be doing other things in your remote centers which I have really no way of controlling from here. So, however good the lecture may be the point is that students do not pay utmost attention ok. The second thing is that students assume that they understand something because they can follow the lecture. These are the two key things that happen during the lecturing or information transmission phase which are assumptions that we often assume otherwise. Okay. Then the second thing is when instructors are asking questions, often what happens is that these questions are answered only by few who are the high achievers in your class and others might be left behind. Okay. And as a result of which 
No, even when students are asking questions, they are also asked only by a few and others may keep quiet. Okay. So, as a result of this, what happens is the instructor may assume that all the students have understood when in fact many of the students have really not understood the concept or the topic that they are trying to explain. Now, if you look at what happens outside the classroom during the assimilation phase, so the instructor has given problem sets and assignments and we find that these assignments may be too challenging for some students or they may be too boring for other students. So, possibly this could be one reason why you know people simply submit somebody else's assignment as their own. Okay. The second thing that could happen is students will typically study just before the assignment submission deadline or the exam. Okay. So, often what happens is that the students have not got mastery over the content soon after the class, but they defer getting mastery over the content to just before the exam. So, as a result of which what happens is that they focus on the assessment aspect and not on the concept attainment aspect. So, they simply look at okay, what are the questions that this instructor gave in the last year and try to somehow using just the rote learning method try to get to a mechanism of scoring well in the exam. Okay, so, these are the main limitations of the traditional classroom model. When we say we want to flip the classroom, what does that mean? It means that in the traditional case, information transmission is happening in the class and assimilation is happening outside the class. So, what we want to do is we want to flip this by saying that let the information transmission happen outside the class and let the assimilation happen inside the class. Okay, so, the key reason for doing that is that the information transmission is a lower cognitive level activity. So, it is simply that the student needs to hear and the student needs to be able to recall or the student needs to be able to explain. So, some lower cognitive level activities can be delegated to outside the classroom. So, students can be given a video, students there are many videos available and so students can be told to watch some video for the information part of any concept. Okay. So, for example, suppose I am teaching about arrays, what I can say is I can simply point to one of the many videos which talk about what is the structure of an array, what is the syntax of an array and so on and the important part of assimilation where they gain mastery over the content, we can do in the class by doing problem solving exercises involving arrays. Okay. So, that is flipping the classroom, going from information transmission in class and assimilation outside class to going to information transmission outside class and assimilation in class. Okay. So, this second activity we have already done, it is the same poll that I had carried out earlier and uh, since we have already had this session in the morning of active learning, I am very glad to see that most of you have opted for teacher B as the strategy which is more useful for student learning because the teacher B strategy is based on active learning. So, what is flipped classroom? A flipped classroom is one way to ensure that class time is spent in assimilation rather than in information transmission. So, in this case the instructor finds or creates videos on the topic, students watch the video before coming to the class and the class time is spent in activities and discussion. So, the class time is not spent in simply telling the students about some concept, the class time is spent in helping the student acquire mastery over that concept through problem solving, through exercises, through debates through design, questions and so on. Okay, so, typically what is a flipped classroom video? A flipped classroom video is usually 10 to 20 minutes of lecture on one concept. The video may include slides, audio, annotation, writing on a tablet, screen capture of an app. So, in this case in CS 101, it may be that screen capture of how a program executes in code blocks. All of these can be captured together to create a flipped classroom video. Okay. So, since we have already going to be doing 
some of these videos as part of the larger MOOC that will happen. I am not going to go to any example. So we have lot of examples you can see on these sites. So which are the various uh, flipped classroom videos. Okay. Now what is the activity? So the important thing to focus on from our active learning aspect is the activities that happen in the flipped classroom. Okay. So what are these activities that take place? So in one case, the content is given context. So you give real world scenarios for your students to solve problems with. For example, if you have again, if you have talked about arrays, you give a problem in a real world context where they need to use arrays in order to solve it. So as a result of this context, what happens is that students are actively engaged in problem solving and critical thinking beyond the traditional course. In the traditional course, they are sitting in the classroom at best absorbing information and getting up to the conceptual level. Whereas here in this case, they are actively engaged with problem solving and critical thinking. Okay. So students are encouraged to ask exploratory questions and delve beyond the core curriculum. So even if the curriculum says that okay, the topic has to be taught in the next course, so what happens is that students happen to get to such deeper topics because they have been engaging actively with the content. So students as a result are transformed from passive listeners to active learners. Okay. All of today we have been talking about active learning. So to recall one more time, what is active learning is that the instructor creates carefully designed activities that require the students to talk, write, reflect and express their thinking. So you have already written activities for think, pair, share and peer instruction questions. Okay, and the students go beyond listening, copying of notes and execution of procedures. They actually engage with the content, they talk to their neighbor. So the benefits that we saw were that students are actively engaged and learn from each other. It builds a friendly yet academic atmosphere and it includes all the students in the teaching learning process. So what happens in a flipped classroom and active learning? So the key point to note here is this, that the classroom with the instructor and peers present is more useful for students to apply their learning rather than listening to information transmission and asking clarifications. Okay. So when we are teaching in the traditional mode, what we are doing is we are doing information transmission we are telling the students that okay, this is how a sorting algorithm works or this is how something else works and the students are simply asking for clarifications. Whereas the point of a flipped classroom is that the classroom with the instructor and peers present is more useful for students to apply their learning, more useful for them to solve problems, more useful for them to do something, learning by doing as somebody had also said in the chat window to do something with the content that they have already learned. So in a flipped classroom, the in-class time can be devoted to tasks that promote active learning okay, since the information transmission happens before the class. So that is the key difference. Okay. So the information transmission part is moved outside the class and the assimilation part is moved to inside the class. So does a flipped classroom work? So as we saw in the previous two or three sessions, there are many studies that establish the benefits of active learning strategies. Okay. So flipped classrooms that incorporate active learning, they also reap these benefits. Okay. So there are two references that I have uh, put in here, which are specific to flipped classrooms. So flipped classrooms with peer discussions and flipping the classroom with small group discussions such as think pair share, both of them have there are experiments which show that they result in significant learning gains for the student. So since we have been talking about active learning all throughout since the morning and you are already familiar with earlier research that we talked about why, what the gains of active learning are higher than those of traditional learning. So the only point that you want to keep in mind is the flipped classroom is not simply about creating the video. So watch the video outside of the class and what you do in the class. So even if we are saying that okay, there is a MOOC uh, on 
CS101 which is going to be transmitted from some central place and the local instructor's job, you as the local instructor when you are in your class, your job is not to simply play the video, but your job is to come up with these activities which will help your students to reap the benefits of active learning. So, your job is to come up with peer instruction questions that you will use in your classroom based on the video that you are going to ask the students to watch as part of the MOOC. Okay. So, have a short summary at this point. Why is flip classroom a good idea? Because the class time is spent in assimilation rather than information transmission. Also, the class time is spent in higher cognitive levels. So, what do we mean by cognitive levels? By cognitive levels, what we mean is that students apply their knowledge or they analyze a particular situation or they create some new knowledge okay? rather than simply the lower levels of recalling what they have learnt or trying to understand or being able to explain something which all of which can be done by rote learning. So, the important idea here is that the support of the peers and the instructor is available while working on the higher cognitive levels in a flipped classroom. So, that is the key difference that the support is available while they are working not simply while they are listening. Okay. So, let us do one activity here. So, the activity is that suppose your institute made it compulsory for you to use the flipped classroom mode. Okay. So, let us say for CS 101. So, you found an excellent video on your topic and asked your students to watch it before the class. Okay. So, the question is what will you do in the class most of the time? So, let us say for example, there are there is a site which uh, IIT Bombay has which is called the spoken tutorial dot org. That site has lot of flip classroom videos that can be used for flip classroom on C++ programming. Okay. So, the question is suppose we pick one topic, let us say we pick the topic of uh, arrays or a topic of recursions or whatever is your favorite topic. Okay. So, you pick that topic and you say that okay, the students have watched a video on that topic. Now, your question is what is it that <coughs> you will do in the class? Very specific to the topic of your choice. So, do not send me answers by the chat right now. Right now, we are only doing the think phase where people have to think individually. Okay, only after the discussion and all, we want to go to the share phase where you send me answers over chat. So, some of you are sending answers like saying you will ask a query in the classroom. So, that is exactly what I am saying. We need to be a little bit more specific that is in the category of I will do problem solving. Okay. So, you need to be a little more specific of what will you do, what will students do during the activity. Okay. So, many centers people seem to have finished writing the think phase. So, let us move on to the pair phase. So, at the pair phase, what you want to do is examine your neighbor's answer. So, here is the important thing where you will apply what you have learned since the morning. Okay. So, what you want to do is examine whether it helps the student to work on higher cognitive levels. Higher cognitive levels is apply, analyze rather than simply repeat or clarify. Okay. So, together make your answers more specific so that your strategy develops the higher cognitive levels of your students. Okay. So, that they go beyond simply being able to explain what is an array. So, they should be able to create a program which involves arrays. Okay. So, what is the activity that you will do in order to facilitate that? So, you can have about 5 minutes for this discussion. So, many of you have started sending responses through AVU chat and a lot of them are valid responses. In for example, somebody is saying that I will give exercises in the class, go around the class and address the doubts, design problems related to the same topic for the students, conduct short quizzes. Point I want to make is for those who are still saying that I will take queries or answer clarification or explain it in a simpler manner. The point you have to keep in mind is that is really not a flipped classroom. That is simply just the instructor asking the student to watch a video and then repeating whatever the content of the video once again in the classroom. So, that is not a flipped classroom that does not achieve the purpose. The purpose is achieved only when students are doing active learning. 
And what we have seen since the morning, all the four sessions that we have talked about, is that in active learning, students have to go beyond simply asking queries and clarifying their doubt. Many of you are saying solve tutorial problems. So even for solve tutorial problems, what we want to be sure is that the students are solving the problems and not simply watching the instructor solve the problem. Lot of answers are of the type that I will give TPS activities or ask some question from the students, group discussions, suggestions like rapid fire questions. See, somebody is saying that I will take a real time example and then make it into small steps. Identifying multiple solutions to a problem. Okay, cross questioning between student groups. So that is again a very good strategy that you can use that you can have one set of students create a question which the another set of students have to answer. So it kind of becomes a competition for the students and they have great fun. So when we implement such a strategy, we find that students engage very deeply with the content that they are not simply setting a difficult question for the other group, but they are also setting a conceptually deep question which helps their own learning also. Okay, so I think we have seen enough choices so far uh, and many of the suggestions that are coming are specific. There are still a large number of broad suggestions which are coming. So to those centers, I would suggest that you go a little more deeply into these examples so that you can see what the what is meant by specific activities. Okay, so here is an example. So suppose we take uh, programming as a course and the array, topic of arrays. Okay. So the pre-class activity may be to watch a video that defines an array and shows C++ examples on using use of arrays. Okay, so it simply says that array is defined as int something something, and here is an example what we saw in the previous session that you can show an example of how an array is initialized and how the array values are printed out. Okay. So the in class activity that you can carry out now could be that one is you could give a worksheet which has programs using arrays where the students have to predict the output of sum. Okay. So instead of a worksheet you could also create this into a peer instruction question as we saw in the previous session. You can have students find errors in other programs and you can have students insert missing code into the program. So you can create small programs involving arrays as part of this worksheet and you can either have students to work on the worksheet in class and submit it at the end of the class or you can have students to work on it in the peer instruction model by displaying the questions and then having them discuss about it. Okay. The other thing that you can do is you can carry out a think pair share activity to write a program to sort an array. Okay. So this is one example of what can be done in a flipped classroom. Another example from a different course that I teach which is communication networks. So here again what we can do is suppose the topic is IP addressing. So IP addressing traditionally is a topic in which there is a lot of telling where we have to say that okay, what is a class A address, what is a class B address and so on. So in this case, again you can delegate that entire information transmission to the pre-class activity of watching the video. So the students watch a video that describes the basic mechanism for assigning IP addresses in a network and in the class they can do peer instruction questions on IP address classes. So you can show an IP address and ask them to vote on whether it is class A or class B or class C or you can ask them to construct an IP address of a certain class. Okay. The second thing that you could do is you could also have a debate like what we had in the beginning of this session. You could have a debate on the pros and cons of hierarchical addressing and another activity that you could do is you can have think pair share activities to design solutions to reduce inefficient use of address space. So there are many such activities that can be done in your class which is beyond simply clarifying the doubts that the students have got as a result of watching the video. Okay. So as instructors what we feel is this clarification of doubts is the most important thing okay. and after watching a video certainly students are going to have some doubts which need clarification. But what we want to do here is to go beyond simply doubt clarification, but generate some activities 
which will help the students to go deeper into the content. Okay. So, here is an important point that we have to be alert about. A flipped classroom is not an instructor simply creating lecture videos. It is also not students simply watching these lecture videos. Okay. And finally, it is not the instructor simply giving clarifications in the class. Okay. All this has to happen, but it is effective only if in addition to all of this, the instructor creates structured learning activities to be carried out in class for students to apply what they learned from the videos. So, that is when the flipped classroom becomes really effective. Okay. So, the key elements in a flipped classroom are first is you want to give students an opportunity to gain first exposure to the topic before the class. Okay. Now, the obvious question is why will students watch the video? Okay. Where is the incentive for them to watch the video? If they are not used to watching videos, if they are not used to doing homeworks, why should they do this before they come to class? And what happens if they come to class without having watched the videos? So, what we can, what we need to do here is we want to provide incentives for students to prepare for class. Okay. So, one way of incentivizing them is to say that look only if you watch the video will you get any benefit out of coming to the class. Okay. And after a couple of such sessions they realize that in order to apply their knowledge they need to watch the video first. So, if a positive incentive does not work we can always use an incentive of conducting a very short quiz at the beginning of every class. You know. So, for many of us who need to also take attendance, this quiz can also serve the purpose of attendance. The quiz can simply be some very simple question on the topic that was asked. For example, you may simply ask them that okay, which ensures that they have watched the video. Okay. So, you may simply ask them let us say what is the syntax of a declaration or a if then else or whatever construct that you have, you are going to deal with in that particular class. So, asking a simple question provides an incentive for students to prepare for the class and this can also serve the purpose for those of us who need to you know take attendance because of whatever reasons it, it can also serve that purpose. And in order that the students are not under pressure thinking that every class there is going to be a quiz, you can say that the best k out of n quizzes is going to be considered for the exam. Okay. So, that is one way of providing incentives for students to prepare for the class. The third thing that you want to do is facilitate higher level cognitive activities. So, once again we are emphasizing on this higher level activities. Higher level activities means you do something with the knowledge that you have gained. Instead of simply saying that okay, I know what is an array, I know how to define an array you start writing programs which involve arrays and you start designing programs which require that particular data structure for their solution. And finally, the fourth thing in a flipped classroom is to provide mechanisms for students to get feedback from peers and instructors. So, two mechanisms we have already seen one is the peer instruction mechanism where students talk to each other and the other is the think pair share mechanism where once again students talk to each other in pairs and then talk to each other as a group in the entire class. Okay, one way of them getting feedback from the instructor is in the is during the share phase of think pair share or when the instructor is going around the classroom while the students are carrying out their activities. So, these are the four key steps involved in a flip classroom and not simply creating and watching of the videos. So, what are some effective in class activities? This is exactly what we have been talking about since the morning. Okay. So, peer instruction questions are one set of in class activities. They are used for ensuring conceptual understanding and addressing common misconceptions. Think pair share is another set of effective in class activities which can be used for application of concepts and tackling of design problems. Okay, group problem solving is a third type of activity which we have not really talked about how to implement, but informally it essentially means giving a problem to students and letting them work in teams and then slowly reducing the size of that team. So, that all the students get competent with that particular uh, content. 
So, these are some effective in class activities that you can use in order to ensure that not only your own classroom is effective, but also when you have to run a flipped classroom using somebody else's videos, you can do it effectively. Here are some references where if you need to find out more about what is flipped classroom, how to set up flipped classrooms and so on. So, here are some references that you can use. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.